In this video, I'm going to show how you can quickly paint your minis to a standard like this. Obviously, I'm painting an Eldari model, but you can apply the same techniques and general ideas to any other model in your collection. Every now and then, I look at armies that are really well painted. Troops and tanks in the same color scheme, arranged in formation, on the table. It's just an awesome thing to look at. I often think to myself how great it would be to have one of my own. Being fully aware that it would probably just stand in my cabinet. But it's still fun to dream and sometimes I will sit down and create a prototype. And some of these prototypes you have already seen painted on this channel. It's a great change of pace and I enjoy finding shortcuts to impactful effects and experimenting with products that I would not use in my more planned out projects. And I always learn something new, which is always fun and exciting. When people ask me what my favorite factions are in the Warhammer 40k universe, and if you at least someone have followed this channel over the years, you will already know that my answer is Space Marines and Necrons. But one faction that lurks close behind on my list has always been Eldar, or Eldari as they are called today. Their craft world schemes usually consist of flashy colors, and sometimes they even use striking complementary contrasts. In short, you can have a lot of fun with colors and color combinations. I mean, you can literally just pick three colors from your pile at random, and you will have a proper scheme for Eldar. One particular scheme that always appealed to me the most, however, is Mimera, with their armors transitioning from green to blue which offers a lot of room for color shifts and interesting effects. As always with these prototype videos, I wanted to find a balance between fast, or let's rather say achievable by beginners, and the end result looking really good. Because I hate the idea of going fast for the sake of just going fast and the result looking whatever, when you can be quick and at the same time have great results. It all started with finding base colors I like. And notice how I didn't say the right base colors, because in the end, the right colors are simply the ones that appeal to you, no matter what any gatekeeper might be trying to tell you. So I put down a couple of turquoise blues and greens next to each other to see how they would interact, and then based my final choice on this. I settled on Emerald by Vallejo for my greenish base color, and I applied it up to the area where I wanted the transition to be. And then I went a little further. And you'll see why I did that in a bit. Of course, you can do all of the base color application with an airbrush if you want to speed it up. My blue base color would be Thousand Suns Blue, which is a turquoise, but in the presence of the emerald, which leans more towards green, it appears a little more blue. After adding the first layer, it just looked a bit too dark, so I mixed in Kalga Blue at a ratio of about 50-50 until the two main colors matched up in brightness. It was important to start with brighter colors because I would create color transitions mainly using shades and this process will darken the whole miniature overall. Once both layers were opaque, the time had come to create the transitions. Again, you can do this with an airbrush just using transparent layers, but I wanted to show you that it's not hard doing it by brush either. You will most likely know from experience that layers of paint rarely go on opaquely in a one pass over a primer, for example. You saw that it took me a couple of layers to get the green and blue opaque enough in the beginning. We can use this to our advantage here. So without any major thinning beyond the moist brush to start with, I'm applying a layer of my Thousand Suns and Kalinger Blue mix over the transitional areas, pushing the pigments up into the already blue area. This way we don't have any staining or any of the pigment accumulating in areas that we don't want it to. And if we push it into the same color, it doesn't matter if it accumulates there. I repeated this process two or three times, each time covering less and less area towards the blue, which leaves the emerald to shine through where I covered it with less light. For one of the next videos, I want to take this basic scheme and show you how we can quickly, with just a few general ideas, improve paint shops like this. So you can improve your pigment pushing skills gradually. And if that sounds great, please let me know in the comments, because from what people in my community tell me, this is what's missing on YouTube. As there seems to be a lot of basic and beginner content and a lot of advanced content, but the in-between, the how do you get from beginner to intermediate and advanced is missing or lacking a bit. And while we are at the subject of improving, if you want to level up your painting skills, it's also a good idea to switch subjects now and then. And a switch like that to supercharge your painting could be moving up in scale. 
Large scale models are a lot easier to paint, there's just so much more room and not everything has to be stylized as much. The good thing is, you can support one of the pillars of the YouTube painting community while you're broadening your horizon with some great characters. Thanks a lot to Miniac for sponsoring this video. He was running his first Kickstarter campaign a while ago, featuring these three awesome wood elf models cast in high quality resin. You get to pick between a witch, a warrior and a ranger or just get all three of them. The miniatures are easy to assemble. They fit together really well and they all have a lot of character. Personally, I like the detail on the scouts and all of them are done in rather dynamic and dramatic poses. The ranger probably being my favorite, crouching down while stalking his next victim. Each one of them offers a lot of room to try out different materials and textures and will make an awesome addition to your display cabinet. Lead pledging is available right now and the good thing is a lot of the stretch goals have already been unlocked, like 32mm versions and you can also get the STL files to print them out yourself. Along with the miniatures you can get access to three courses, one for each of the minis taught by Miniac himself, Ben Cantor and John Ninas. You can also get this cool branded brush coffin that Scott has been developing that will protect your brushes during transport but also offers a safe storage option for your painting desk. So your babies are protected at all times. So if you are interested in any of these great products, you would like to try your hands in some great 75mm sculpts, follow the link in the description that will lead you directly to the Kickstarter Late Pledge page and soon you'll get to push some pigment on these really great looking characters. Now we need to create some depth and contrast on the figure and like I said, I mainly want to use shading since that is a faster process than building up highlights because it doesn't need as much control. Of course, it doesn't mean you can just slap on a wash and everything will be fine. You will still need to babysit the pigment a little. Also try to find the mistake I made here during this step or let's rather say try to predict what I wasn't happy with in the end. And don't worry, I'll give you the resolution and also a solution to the problem when I show you the result. The first thing I did was to wash the whole mini with a diluted mix of athematic blue and contrast medium. I almost never used the contrast paints the way they were intended and thus the comment section bullies me into painting a space marine in under 30 minutes. But it has its other qualities like I showed in a couple of other videos already. I like using them as something that I call a better wash because due to its properties it creates smoother transitions than regular washes, mainly because of its longer drying time. You just got to make sure to cover the whole mini in a layer of paint and it will almost never leave the typical coffee staining effect of regular inks and washes. And while doing this, I keep directing the pigments to areas that I want shaded. Like the recesses of course, but also look at the shoulder pads and how I let the pigment pool in the lower areas to create the highlight effect for the top part. That is not covered as much by the contrast paint. Next I was adding a darker shade because I wanted deeper shadows. Don't forget, it's important to let each layer dry thoroughly before you move on. And that shouldn't be a problem if you're in batch painting, but just be aware of it. And then I started to think about how I could make the gradient more interesting. So I used Talisar Blue for the upper areas and to darken the midsection, reset. Again, see how you can direct the pigments towards an area you want to shade. Even if there's no recess, the contrast paint can settle in and see how it leaves a relatively smooth gradient with minimum effort. For the lower parts of the armor, I wanted to increase the emerald green effects, so I used thinned down contrast warp lightning. Not necessarily to shade, but more to shift the base color more towards green, which gave it a really awesome overall effect and color shift from top to bottom. Now one last thing I wasn't happy with was the overall darker shades, and you can see what I mean on the knee pads. They're just about the same brightness all over, so I went ahead and shaded some areas with Griff Charger Gray by letting the pigment settle in the lower areas of the spherical shapes. Last I touched up a few of these recesses and made them darker and that's the shading done. Remember when I told you to predict what I wouldn't be happy with after this step? If you thought it was the shine the contrast paints adds to everything it touches, then you were absolutely right. So I had to fix the shine with a layer of AK Ultramont varnish through the airbrush. You can see that you can create awesome shading effects with this method. We already talked about the shoulders, but notice also the chest plates and the abdominal armor plates and how you can leave the contrast paint to settle in some areas and not in others to create awesome contrasts. The next step I had to introduce some light 
and since we shaded most of the areas, there is no need to touch up any of the mid-tones. So I moved straight into the edge highlights for these brightest spots on the mini. I added a little bit of wolf gray to the emerald and started to clean up the edges of the green areas. I used the same mix on the blue areas, like here on the right shoulder, you can see that, but later decided to highlight it with a mix of the blue base color and wolf gray instead. There's no right or wrong here. You could stick to one highlight color. It would give an awesome effect and draw everything a bit more together. In the end, doing the highlights in the same hue as the base color just looked a tiny bit better to me. Remember, just stick to the results you personally like best. I stuck to the pattern I chose here and mixed the green highlight color for the lower areas. Remember I shaded those with warp lightning and they turned a lot more green than the base color. So I picked out some edges and details with a relatively similar color, a mix from emerald and mood green. I added one more highlight layer, adding a bit more wolf gray to the respective mixes and covering less area focusing more on the edges that were facing out. To stick with the approachable theme for the whole miniature, I also wanted to find a doable approach for the sword that would look great and this is what I came up with. I made sure I had an opaque layer of wolf gray covering the whole blade of the sword, and then covered it with one layer of diluted Griff Charger gray, and I directed the pigments a bit to where I wanted them to stay, but I wasn't set on an initial pattern. Sometimes it's fun to just let the paint dry where it wants and work with the results. After this was dry and the paint had given me somewhat of an initial pattern of highlights and shades, I switched to Talisar Blue. Remember that I said I would tell you how to fix the shine problem we have while working with contrast paint? Here's how I did it. I prepared the color a bit on the palette, adding about one third of ultra matte varnish and the tiniest bit of dish soap to break the surface tension. That way I can spread the paint out a bit more easily where needed. Basically, this will avoid the effect you can see on screen now and the paint will cover more towards edges and corners. Now we're moving into a more precise style of painting for a second. I know I said this will be a more beginner friendly video, but bear with me. We can do all of this even without a lot of practice. It might just end up a tiny bit rougher, but the more you practice this, the smoother your results will be without a lot of additional time investment. What I'm doing is I'm covering the darker areas of my initial sketch with additional layers. Sometimes it takes two or three, sometimes four. You can go as dark as you want here by adding as many layers as you see fit. And then I dilute the contrast paint even more. In this case, I added additional matte varnish and I glaze over the transitional areas to smooth them out. Usually you can just go darker without caring much for blending in these already shaded parts as you can see. This is why I mentioned initially that shading is always easier to do than highlighting. The last step is to treat the edges and for the highest edge I went straight over it with wolf grey. The lower edges I added a tiny bit of Kalga blue to the wolf grey for the first pass and I used pure wolf grey again for the second highlights, again covering less area. Using the broad side of the brush and carefully touching the edge worked perfectly here. I feel like the sculptors pay a lot more attention to this on the newer figures than on the old ones. The shocking thing is that all of this took me less than 15 minutes. And even if it takes you twice as long because you don't have the experience and you're a bit unsure about your brush control, that's quite an impressive result for under 30 minutes. My Meara's helmets are traditionally black and I started with the base layer of Eshing Grey mixed with black 
And then on top of that, I added a color shift with Volumes Pink. To get a matte result, again I was thinning the contrast paint with Ultramatte Varnish. I really liked how the purple pooled in the front part of the helmet. That made for an interesting effect. I didn't want to spend too much time on the weapons, so I only put white aluminium on some of the edges for a chipped effect, also to create some readability on the weapon. And then I covered the black in Volopus Pink too. Going back to the helmet, I just added a couple of edge highlights with mixes of ashen grey and wolf grey that got slightly brighter each time. For the plume, is it called a plume? Uh, please tell me in the comment section. I went with a base coat of Screamer Pink. Someone on the live stream where I started the, this paint shop after seeing the blue green gradient said it's only missing some purple pink for that retro wave feeling. So I went with that and highlighted the scream of pink with reflex rose ink by Amsterdam for that ink tense bright finish. And I shaded it with a layer of wallops pink for that extra depth. The last thing to do was the face mask and the goal was to have a very cold blue highlight and warm shadows to add some focus on the face area because every other color on the mini is generally very cool and this tiny detail of warm colors would draw a lot of attention. My base color was stone gray which I highlighted up with wolf gray again because I, I like how the bluish highlights on the stone gray almost look like a shine or an inner glow on the mask. Frame the face in a warm color and to give it more of a bone white effect, I just added very diluted dark cut flesh to the recesses. The last thing I did was to treat all gems in a typical way. and I just added some purple to the eyes and I didn't go too bright with that highlight as keeping them dark would make them stand out more against the bright face mask. Last but not least I added some color to the base by just adding a few different tones and seeing where it would lead me. I ended up adding red tones but also greens and eventually settled on adding some moss to the wood and the stone and eventually transitioned into using some moss foliage that I just dry brushed a little to add some depth and make it fit more to the rest of the painted parts. Ready for the final results? I'm really happy about how this one turned out. Green to blue gradient looks really satisfying and the best thing about it is that everything is really quick to do while still giving great results. The biggest surprise definitely was how well the sword turned out, even with just really basic techniques and very little time investment. Don't forget to keep an eye out on this channel for one of the next videos where we are going to talk about how to go beyond tabletop standard on this guy. I think you could even subscribe so YouTube will notify you when it's out. And as always, thanks a lot to all of these pigment pushers that decided to support me on Patreon. You guys keep the lights on, couldn't do it without you.